thank you, Franco. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here. It's my pleasure to introduce the speakers of this morning's session. Uh, the first one is Professor Estrada from Yeza Business School in Barcelona. Is going to discuss the returns, the composition model, what it is, and what it forecasts now. So it's my pleasure. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for the, uh, uh, for the invitation to uh, speak in this uh, symposium. Uh, I have to tell you the truth. When uh, I got the first email from uh, Franco some time ago and he invited me to a symposium on return predictability, uh, uh, my first thought was, I don't know if I'm going to fit, because I don't believe in return predictability. Um, and that's actually, I'm going to start actually that, that way. Uh, and then, well, you know, that is mostly true, but, but I also think that there are some conditions under which we are a little bit better at predicting than under some other conditions. Under most of them, we're pretty bad, but under some others, uh, we're a little bit better, and that's what I want to emphasize uh, with this uh, return decomposition model. So uh, they asked me to speak for about uh, 35 minutes or so and to leave about uh, 10 minutes for for Q&A, so let me just jump uh, uh, right in. And uh, you may or may not have heard about Philip Tedlock. He actually uh, put together a, a very ambitious uh, statistical study on predictions and forecasting in general. Uh, he actually spent quite a bit of time uh, doing that. I'll, I'll show you how much time in, uh, uh, in just a minute. And he compiled everything in a book that was published uh, just a few years ago. Uh, and uh, in that book, he actually puts together, uh, he follows 284 people. Uh, and the interesting thing of this is this is not just financial forecasting. It's financial, economic, political. It's all sorts of uh, different types of forecasting. Uh, very ambitious, like I said before. He followed people over 20 years, and he actually, at the end of that, put together over 82,000 predictions. And then he evaluated the success of the forecast. That's what he found. The vast majority performs worse than random chance. All right? So that's kind of my starting point, to, just to give you an idea how much I believe in forecasting. Um, so in general, I think that this is pretty powerful evidence. And as a matter of fact, I read uh, just last week that Tetlog was actually updating uh, his study. And that what he's going to publish in another book is that he's still finding pretty much the same results. All right? So that being said, my second point uh, is uh, Warren Buffett. I think that uh, most people would agree that Warren Buffett has been a very successful investor. And when, when it comes to forecasting the market, he says, I never had the faintest idea what the stock market is going to do in the next six months or the next year or the next two. But I think it is very easy to see what is likely to happen over the long term. And we're little by little sort of collapsing into what I think are, are some of the conditions under which we can predict a little bit better. And one of those is actually that we don't try to forecast tomorrow, next week, or next month, or next year, but that we actually do forecasts for the longer term. And if you think about it for just a minute, most of what we call models in finance are equilibrium models. And by equilibrium models, we basically mean something that we eventually expect it to be true. Uh, you know, to take the simplest model in finance, the CAPM, which actually relates beta with expected return. Uh, we don't really expect in finance that every single stock with a higher beta is always going to have every day, week, month, or year a higher return than uh, another stock with a lower beta. What we expect is that in the long term, that the higher the beta of the portfolio, the higher is going to be the return of that portfolio. So, and this goes, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit uh, towards what Warren Buffett is saying that you know, in the short term, there's not much that we can say. But if we actually start looking in the longer term, maybe we can say something a little bit more uh, intelligent. All right. Second. Um, or third thing that is interesting, uh, this is a Morningstar, a well-known company that uh, does many things. And one of the things that uh, they do, as you know, uh, is that they have this huge database of funds, which is mostly accessible uh, online. And two of the many things that they report for each fund, one is the performance of the fund, which they call investment return. And the other is the performance of investors in the fund, what they call investor return. And they typically compare the two. And, and the, there's a difference between these two, because if you take, say, 
any five-year period, uh, the performance of the fund basically is given by you know, the, the change in the share price of that fund between the beginning and the end, which accounts for everything that happened in between, all the cost and all the dividends paid and so forth. Uh, but th the problem with that is that most investors, you know, if you evaluate them over the same five-year period, they don't buy here and, and, and sell here. What they do is they buy and sell, they buy and sell, they buy and sell, and what most of the evidence tends to show is that investors tend to buy more when prices are high and they tend to sell or buy less when prices are low, which is obviously the reverse of what we would like to do, but you know, our crowd following behavior actually sort of pushes us towards doing that. Well, this is actually for the last 10 years, actually Morningstar updates this study every year and they call it Mind the Gap the gap being between the investment return and the investor return, and the Mind the Gap 2014 uh, puts together the information for the uh, 10 years ending on December 31st, 2013. The numbers that you see here are for different uh, types of funds. So these are aggregates across, say, US equity funds and balance funds and municipal bond funds and so forth. So these are the returns of the fund. These are the return of investors in those funds, and this is what they call the return gap or the investor gap, which is the difference between the return of these funds and the return that investors got out of those funds. And as you see here, in all cases, they're negative. As a matter of fact, if you look across the very many thousands of funds that they follow, over 10 years, investors actually obtain 2.5% per year less than the funds themselves. In other words, if these investors had not been buy and hold, they would have a uh, bought at the end of uh, at the 10-year period and sold at the end of the 10-year period, that number should be zero. But because investors actually went in and out and in and out and in and out of the funds, they actually lost at the mean annual rate of 2.5%, compound that over 10 years, and actually that's a huge amount. You left about uh, over one-third of the money on the table exclusively due to bad timing. And, and this is, again, because we tend to think that we know when prices are uh, good to enter and uh, good to sell, that is, when they're low enough or high enough, and then the evidence shows that we actually don't. We think that we knew, but we didn't know in the end, and that's what those numbers actually say, that we thought that we knew, but in the end, we didn't know. So this is kind of the second piece of evidence that says, you know, we, we sort of like the idea of forecasting, but when you aggregate the evidence, when you look at the evidence, we're not that good at forecasting uh, returns. Now, he, here's John Bogle, whom you know as the uh, founder of Vanguard, and uh, Vogel actually starts trying to lay down the conditions under which our forecast might be a little bit better. And so he says, the performance of individual securities is unpredictable, the performance of portfolios of securities is unpredictable on any short-term basis, yet when we look at portfolios of securities on a longer-term basis, the unpredictable becomes far more predictable. And there you have the two conditions that actually makes us a little bit better forecasters than all the others. One is that we actually discuss aggregate portfolios, and the more aggregate, the better. So we're going to forecast better sectors and companies, and we're going to forecast better markets than sectors, and then on a longer-term basis, which means that the longer the period for which we make the forecast, maybe the more that we can say something intelligent about what may happen in the, uh, in the future. And this uh, RDM that I will describe in a minute, this returns decomposition model, basically focuses on that, focuses on making market forecasts rather than sector or individual companies, and focuses on the medium to long term rather than in the, um, uh, in the short term. Now, uh, this is Keynes. Uh, Keynes, most of you may know as an economist, and as an economist, there's two things about Keynes uh, that most people agree about. Uh, one is that he was very influential. He died many years ago, and, but he was still talking about Keynes all the time. Uh, and uh, the second is that he was actually very controversial, because for every person that you have that sort of agrees with Keynes' ideas of how to get out of a depression or a recession, uh, there's someone actually that disagrees and proposes something that is actually are completely different from that. So at the end of the day, you know, he, he was very well known and very influential as an economist. He was always very, also very controversial. But he was also a fantastic investor. Uh, very few people actually know this, although it's getting to be more and more well known. There's a recent book, actually, that explores 
a Keynes track record uh, as an investor, and, and as an investor, he was actually very good. He was very wealthy. Uh, he made most of that money by himself trading in the market, but he also managed money for other people, among them uh, the King's College of the University of Cambridge. And uh, he managed that endowment for about 13 years. Uh, Time of part of that uh, was actually right around the Great Depression, and at the same time that in those 13 years, the English market lost market cap at the mean annual rate of 1%, uh, then Keynes endowment actually grew at the mean annual rate of 9%. So he actually outperformed the market by 10 percentage points per year over 13 years. Right? So he was a great investor, and actually, if you still have this general theory at home, uh, if you look at chapter 12, uh, chapter 12 is called the state of long-term expectations, and it doesn't talk at all about macroeconomics. It's only a chapter on investment, and in that chapter on investment, he actually draws this distinction between what he called enterprise, <coughs> excuse me, and speculation. Uh, enterprise, he said, is basically you know trying to foresee what is going to be the yield, the return of assets, but over the very long term. And his idea was very simple. You know, companies are in different sectors. Uh, different sectors have different patterns of risk, and those patterns of risk eventually are supposed to yield a return. The riskier the sector, the higher the return that you expect. Sort of end of the story. And his point was that, you know, we might disagree a little bit on the details, but when we make these long-term comparisons, we shouldn't be uh, that uh, far off in terms of what we think. But then, uh, what he called speculation was basically the activity of forecasting the psychology. And he said, well, here, don't even try. You know, we, we don't know anything how people are going to react. People are unpredictable. Investors are unpredictable. More and more, we know nowadays that you know, investors are behavioral, and by that we basically mean that we make a lot of mistakes in life. Well, we make a lot of mistakes when we invest too. And a good part of what behavioral finance is all about is identifying the mistakes that we make, uh, thinking about what are the consequences of those mistakes, and trying to figure out what we can do ab about that. Right? So, so now actually we sort of caught up 70 years down the road or 80 years down the road, we caught up with Keynes in the fact that you know, it's very difficult to foresee or to forecast what uh, <coughs> excuse me what people are going to uh, uh, to do and, and and you know if you if you ever remember or heard about this idea of the beauty contest that that it's always associated with Keynes it actually comes from here because he you know his example was apparently at the time of Keynes a, a lot of the British newspapers used to run contests in which they had pictures of ladies and you had to guess who was going to be chosen as the prettiest one. Now that's tricky because it doesn't imply that you have to choose the one that you think is the prettiest. You have to choose the one that you think that other people think is the prettiest. And he thought about it, speculation is just like that. It doesn't matter what you think a company is worth. What matters when you speculate is what you think that other people think that a company is worth. All right? So that's what speculation, it requires two levels uh, beyond what we typically think here in terms of um, of enterprise. So all that being said, uh, uh, John Bogle, <coughs> who's actually a uh, very a big fan of, of uh, Keynes, he tried to put a little bit of a structure uh, under Keynes' ideas, and he actually made a split, a proposed split between what he called investment return, which comes from two things. First, from the growth of earnings of the companies, and second, for the ability of those companies to pay dividends out of those earnings. So when you put together growth in earnings and dividends paid out of that earnings, that's quote unquote, because in, in economics we call real something else, but that's the real return that we get. You know, that's, uh, but this thing, well, that's speculation. You know, one day is up, one day is down, one day is up, one day is down. That's very difficult to, uh, to forecast. And I'll show you a little bit of information about this uh, in, uh, in just a second, all right? But the model that we're going to discuss basically puts together uh, this. And uh, let me just uh, very quickly illustrate that with a very simple example. So we're going to focus on that, uh, on that period. And if uh, you know, I wanted to know the return of this asset in this period, uh, basically, as we know, that's the capital gain or loss plus the dividend paid during that period, everything relative to the price at the beginning of the period. So it's basically putting together capital gains on losses and, and dividend yields. 
And uh, <coughs> I'm not going to bother you with all the algebraic steps in between, but le let me uh, ask you to believe me that you can rewrite that expression in this way. And these two things are mathematically identical. It just takes uh, a few algebraic steps. And as long as you define G1D as the growth in earnings, uh, excuse me, in dividends between one period and the, and the previous one, uh, G1E, the growth in earnings between one period and the previous one, and delta PE as the change in the PE between the end of the period and the beginning of the other one, these two expressions are absolutely identical. And I'm not trying to complicate your life. Uh, I'm going to show you why it pays to actually decompose returns uh, in, um, uh, in this way. But before we actually do that, let me just show you a very extremely quick example. Uh, you're going to have the slides later on so you can look at, <coughs> at this example uh, later on. So in this period in which we're focusing on, the return that we get is 12%. That return is basically the capital gain between 10708 and 100 plus the 4.2 dividend that uh, the stock paid, everything relative to the beginning stock price, and then you get that 12%. Well, we can get exactly that 12% if we calculate first the growth of earnings, which is 5%, the growth between 4 and 4.2. Um, the growth of uh, earnings, 6%, which is the growth between 10 and 10.6 and the growth in the PE, which is 1.7, and that is the growth between 10.17 here and 10 uh, there. And if we put all that together into the expression we had before, this is the initial dividend yield, this is the growth of dividends, this is the growth of earnings, this is the growth in the PE, and you get to exactly the same 12%. So that's not a mathematical demonstration, it's just a quick example to show you that this thing and this thing are identical from an algebraic um, a point of view. Now, here's the good news, because you know, mo most of the time this looks like an awful thing to uh, sort of remember or memorize or keep in the back of your head. But actually, if you look at that approximation, now you need to add three things only. Uh, it's actually a very, very good approximation. And so it is not identical to calculating this. Uh, but just to give you an idea, I'll go back to the numerical example in just a second. Uh, but I've looked at this on international equity markets at the annual level over a long period of time. Time, and the difference between calculated returns with this expression and this expression is one-tenth of one percent. So it's a very close approximation. The mistakes that we make when we forecast are far higher than, um, than that. So this is the initial dividend yield, which is a number that we know. This is what we expect earnings to grow over the period in which we're going to forecast. And this is what we expect the PE to grow, positive or negative, over the period that uh, we're going to, uh, uh, to forecast. So in the previous example, if you calculate, uh, we know that the return, the exact return was 12%. If you calculate it with the approximation, was 11.7%. But like I said before, uh, typically, at least in equity markets on an annual a basis, the, the mistake is even lower than that. That's one third of one percent, and typically you get one tenth of uh, one percent as a mean uh, mistake. So I'm going to go ahead with that and, and uh, sort of focus on that approximation rather than in the more complicated <coughs> expression. And the reason, one of the reasons that I'm going to focus on the uh, approximation is because that approximation goes back to what Bogle called the investment return and the speculative return. So the growth of earnings and the dividends paid at the beginning of the period, that's what we're going to call the investment return. And the change in the PE is what we're going to call the speculative uh, re return. All right? And so two things for now to uh, keep in mind. One is note the role that uh, two of the most widely used multiples have on forecasting returns. One is the dividend yield, and the other is the P-E ratio. And just uh, very quickly on, on this, uh, this is for the US over the 110 years between the beginning of 1900 and the end of 2009. And uh, <coughs> just very quickly, let me uh, tell you how I did this. Suppose that you're standing at the beginning of the year 1900, you observe a dividend yield, and then you calculate the mean annual return over the subsequent 10 years. So now you have two numbers. 
dividend yield at the beginning of the 10-year period and the actual return observed during that 10-year period. And then you move one period forward and you do the same and over and over and over again. And basically, then you organize everything in one picture, where here you have buckets of uh, dividend yields. And notice that there's no playing around with the numbers so that the picture looks good. Uh, these are very round numbers, 2, 3.5, 3.55, 5, 6.6, 6.58, .6, and then plus 8 and minus uh, and lower than two, and as you see, there's a very clear relationship between the two. That is, if you begin with low dividend yields somewhere here, then your expected returns are low. If you begin with high dividend yields, then your expected returns are high. So, so this relationship actually more or less speaks uh, for itself, and as you see here, that is actually pretty bad. I mean, that is a bad indicator. Historically, the dividend yield in the US, the mean dividend yield was about 4%. At the beginning of this year, was less than half of, of that. Um, we leave all the questions for the end. <coughs> um, same thing with the PE. Picture doesn't look as neat. You know, you feel like cutting that a little bit just to make it a little nicer. Uh, but the idea is the same. So I observe the PE at the beginning of a 10-year period. I observe the 10-year uh, return that follows the observance of that PE, and I do that over and over again, and then I put everything together, where again, notice there's no playing around with the numbers here. These are buckets of PE, and as you see, there's a clear negative relationship. The more you pay when you enter the market, the lower are going to be the, uh, the, the returns. And here's the second bad news for the US market. It's a little expensive. That is, where historically, that number has been around 16. At the beginning of the year, it's actually closer to uh, 290. And finally, <coughs> the uh, very much um, widely used nowadays, the cyclically adjusted PE or CAPE, as some people actually uh, call that. And the CAPE basically shows you the adjusted by inflation, the earnings over the last 10 years on average compared to the actual price. And if you look at that again, here you have exactly that negative relationship. The more you pay, the lower the return. And this is actually of all the uh, multiples of all the indicators, the ones that shows the UX market to be most expensive, uh, at least compared to you know, the situation at the beginning of the year. Actually, that should say 14, not 13. This is the beginning of this year compared to <coughs> the, uh, to, to the average that, um, that we have there. All right, now let me just uh, go back and, and remind you the four terms of the return decomposition model. On the left-hand side, we have the expected return. And then we have on the other side the sum of three things, initial dividend yield, uh, growth in earnings over the period that we're going to forecast and changing the PE over the period that we're going to forecast. And I'm going to show you four pictures now, one for each of those four terms. So this is what would go on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, this is the mean annual return over the last 110 years uh, in the US. The numbers that you see here are the numbers between the beginning and the end of each decade. And the numbers that you see here in the bars are this number uh, annualized. So uh, this number, which is actually about 9.5% or so, uh, is if you compound that over 10 years, then you get 158%. This number, which is about 4%, if you compound that over 10 years, that's 53%, and on and on and on. So the number that I'll ask you to keep in mind for now is 9.4. That is the mean annual return long term in the US. All right? Now we're going to go to the other side of the equation. <coughs> and. Uh, the other side of the equation, each of these numbers is the dividend yield at the beginning of each of those decades, 11 decades that we have there. And as you see, this number actually has fluctuated quite a bit, but as we said before, on average is 4.2%. By the way, uh, notice, let me go back here for just a second, that there's only two decades in which returns, nominal returns, between the beginning and the end were negative, and uh, the worst of all to be an investor in equities is the decade that actually finished just a few minutes ago, uh, by the end of 2009. But look at this. At the beginning of 2009, that was one of the highest dividend yields in history in the US. Probably was just around there, the, the, excuse me, the lowest uh, dividend yield in history, which was uh, right around 1%. And at the very top of the bubble, on February of the year 2000, uh, that number actually fell just slightly under 1%. Where remember, historically, that number has been above uh, 4%. So first term on the right-hand side of the equation is 4.2. Second. 
we need the um, a growth of earnings. This is the mean annual growth of earnings and dividends. You have two things here, but we need only one in each of the 11 decades that we're looking at. That's the number that uh, we want for our model, which is 4.5%. So that tells you that in nominal terms, the mean annual growth of earnings of the US corporate sector was about 4.5%. And look at this picture, completely different. This is what Keynes was calling the, the, you know, the, the speculative return and the, the psychology of the market all over the place. So we have times you know, like the 80s and the 90s in which people are optimistic and they're willing to pay more and more and more. Remember what an increase in the PE basically says. It says that per dollar of earnings per share, you're willing to pay more than before. So that is because you, either you're more optimistic or you think that something has changed that makes you pay more. And the other way around when this number goes down. So in the 80s and the 90s, we had expansions of PEs. But if you look at the 70s and the 2000s, we had contractions of PEs. So over relatively short periods of time, this is going to matter in your pocket. If you were an investor in the 80s and the 90s, you were lucky because people were willing to pay more and that pulled up of your returns. But if you were an investor in the 70s and in the 2000s, you were unlucky because people got pessimistic and that pulled down your returns. But here comes the interesting things. What do you think you're going to get when you average all these things? Almost zero. That is, it, that number there basically means that on a per year basis, the impact of psychology, the impact of speculation, the impact of an expansion in the PE has been about half a percentage point. But remember, the other components, this was the dividend yield, this was the growth in earnings, and this is a change in the PE. Now here we have to remember that we're working with a little approximation, so we get to 9.2 instead of 9.4, but basically what this shows you is that the vast majority of long-term returns, they come from what Bogle and Keynes call investment return. They come from the real thing. They come from the ability of companies to increase earnings and from the ability of paying dividends out of that earnings. All this speculation and manias and optimism and optimism, it actually washes, basically washes out in the long term. And they contribute very, very little to the returns that we obtain in the um, in the long term. So all this is basically to say that most of the returns come from earnings and dividends, and just a little tiny bit of the returns comes from expansion or contractions of uh, those PEs. <coughs> I'm uh, trying to wrap up here. So this is the US. We're going to look at the next 10 years. So we're standing at the beginning of 2014, and we're going to look uh, 10 years ahead. Uh, this is uh, averages across the last 11 decades. We've seen that number before, 4.5, the growth in earnings. We've seen that number before, average PE close to 16. This is a situation at the beginning of this year. Dividend yield under 2%, and PE uh, pushing 19%. Now, when you compare this number to, that, uh, this number to the 4.2 dividend yield that we had seen before and this number to that number, well, that's already telling you that the US market is expensive. And that's already telling you that the expected returns are going to be relatively low. All right, so now we're going to do the following. Remember, we have three terms on the model. Term number one is an observed dividend yield. We're not going to have any fight about that number. That's 1.9% is what we observe. But we need to make two forecasts, how earnings are going to grow and how the PE is going to change. All right, so <coughs> for the growth of earnings, you can completely disagree here. You can have your own hypothesis. And, but for the growth of earnings, I'm going to go back to the idea of mean reversion. And earnings actually are pretty much mean reverting. That says that you know, in some periods, they may grow a lot. In some periods, they may even contract. Uh, but at the end of the day, they sort of go back to the long-term growth rate. So I'm going to assume that on a mean annual basis, over the next 10 years, earnings are going to grow at 4.5%. Feel free to completely disagree with, uh, with that idea. And I'm going to make two hypotheses for the change in the PE, which is going to give me two different returns. Hypothesis number one is mean reversion. And that basically says that at the end of the 10-year forecasting period, the dividend of 18.9 uh, needs to go back to the long-term average of 15.8. And so if you ask the question, 
What does it need to happen on a mean annual basis for a PE to go from 18.9 to 15.8? Well, that's the number that you see there. It needs to fall at the mean annual rate of 1.8%. So if you start from this number and you start going down 1.8% per year over 10 years, you end up with 15.8%. Poss excuse me, possibility or um, scenario number two is the, I, you know, the, the random walk, I just call it sort of a, a something that describes our ignorance, uh, which basically says, look, I looked at this series, I have no idea uh, what it's going to say, and so my forecast of what's going to happen tomorrow is what I know today. And uh, so if what I know today is 18.9, the assumption here is that 10 years down the road, the PE is going to be 18.9. Now, we know that in between those 10 years, it's going to be all over the place, but this zero basically means that on average, you know, on a mean annual basis, if you start on 18.9 and you end on 18.9, this thing is not going to move. And then the, the, the equation that we had before gives you these two forecasts, one for each scenario here. So that is the initial dividend yield, same for both. Growth of earnings, same for both, and assumes mean reversion. And here we have the two scenarios. This is mean reversion, this is random walk, and you get between 4.6 and 6.4. But I remind you that the long term uh, return is 9.4%. So it doesn't look good for the US, and it doesn't look good mostly because we are beginning from an expensive market. Low dividend yields and high P ratios is almost exactly what, from what you, what you would like to enter the market with. Now, I've given variations of this talk in many places, and when you actually put numbers like that and you compare them to that, some people say, ah, forget it, that's not going to happen. We're going to get better than that. And here's one very interesting use of this model, which is actually use the model in reverse. And by using the model in reverse, uh, this is what I mean. Remember that this is a number that we observe, so there's no fighting about this one, and this is a number that we have to forecast. And so suppose that you say, well, I think that we're going to get 15% or 20% or 10%, whatever. Well, as a matter of mathematical necessity, it must be the case that if you start from this number, whatever you need to add here must add to whatever your forecast is. So in the same way that if I tell you, look, next year, with probability one, you're going to get 8% capital gains and 2% dividend yield, then as a matter of mathematical necessity, your return is going to be 10%. Well, here is the same thing. So if you, we begin with just under 2% and you say, I think that the return is going to be 15% per year, well, the sum of the growth in earnings and the change in the PE must add to 13%. All right? And then you have to evaluate how reasonable is that. And the reason that you have to evaluate how reasonable is that, <coughs> excuse me, is because if you ask uh, US investors, uh, that's what they expected uh, back in the year 2010, 13.7% on average. I mean, that's a gigantic number. Historical returns were 9.5%, and people are expecting over 13.5%. And the reason that I point that out is because if you actually now use the model that we're talking about, remember, this is a number that we know. So we have two unknowns, and this is one unknown. So these are different scenarios for the growth in earnings, and these are different scenarios for the terminal PE, where the PE is going to be 10 years down the road. All the numbers that you have in here, these are the mean annual compound returns over the next 10 years, consistent with one scenario for earnings and one scenario for the terminal PE. So you know, let's go back to the expectations of US investors. Look where they are. I mean, if you expect returns of more than 13.7%, then it must happen that either you get, uh, actually both, you get earnings of 9 or 10% growth, but with a terminal PE of 25. Now, a terminal PE of 25, remember, the average is about 16. So you need earnings expanding and twice the historical rate and P ratios that are R much higher than they've been in history and much higher than they are today, and today they're expensive from a historical perspective. Or you need even higher PEs and a little bit more modest, but still very high rate of growth of that, uh, of that earnings. And this is actually one of the, the uses that I like the model, because you know, always people come with crazy forecasts. I expect 15, 20, whatever percent. Well, you know, if you expect whatever, then make a little table like this and find 
what are the conditions that sustain that particular forecast and up to what point those conditions are reasonable. So I, I would say if you're expecting between 14, 15, 16 percent, well, it's not impossible. Everything is possible. But the conditions that would make that possible, they're very, 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 very unlikely, particularly because you need two things at the same time. You need twice the historical growth of earnings and an additional expansion of the PE from a time which is actually particularly high. So bottom line is, I don't know what those expectations come from, but people that are expecting 14% returns are kind of crazy, particularly from where we begin uh, now. So this is my <coughs> final uh, 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 light, to, just to make it a little bit uh, broader. Uh, this is actually for the world market. Uh, and for the world market, uh, this is the historical situation. This is the way we begin today. And uh, begin from there. Uh, that's actually good news. You know, for, if you begin from 16.4, the historical average is 16.9. Uh, well, markets are not expensive in terms of PE, but they're not expensive in terms of DP either. Because you begin with 2.4. Historically, in the world market, the dividend yield has been 2.8. And so the markets are not, not expensive in terms of dividends, but they're not expensive in terms of earnings. Earnings, and that actually shows in the forecast. So if you assume uh, mean reversion in earnings <coughs> and you go back to the uh, same two scenarios that we had before for the uh, uh, change in the PE, this basically says that we're going to end uh, this period with 16.4. This basically says that if you need to increase from 16.4 to 16.9 over 10 years, then you need an increase of one third of 1%. And basically, if you throw in this all together in this model, then you get between 10.5 and 10.2. And the historical return has been about 10.1. So it's a little bit cheap, the market, and then you're going to get a little bit better of, um, of returns compared to what history would actually indicate. So <coughs> the, the numbers would indicate that the US market is relatively expensive, uh, but that the world equity market is actually between uh, properly valued and slightly cheap, and therefore we would expect more or less the, uh, the historical returns. And just to uh, uh, wrap up very quickly, uh, John Bogle refers to this model as the arithmetic of investing, uh, and, and meaning that if you put together the initial dividend yield, the growth of earnings, and the valuation change, when you put all that together, then the return must be what you actually would, uh, uh, would expect. The forecasting matrix is this matrix that I showed you <coughs> before, which I think it's actually very useful because, like I saying before, I was saying before that uh, people always come up with crazy forecasts, and you can always actually make people face what are the things that need to happen in order for their forecast to be true. So if I tell you or you tell me that you expect 14% returns, and I tell you, look, that is not impossible, but it is possible only if you have companies growing their earnings twice the historical average and PE being a lot higher than it's been in history and that it is right now, well, that doesn't make it impossible. It just makes it very unlikely. So actually, that forecasting matrix uh, is a very useful tool. And uh, you know, uh, all in all, I think that the, this model, remember, the broader the portfolio and the longer the period, the more wise, quote unquote, the model uh, uh, becomes. And in terms of a forecast, you know, they're relatively low for the US market. Uh, but they're more or less normal for the, uh, for, for the world market. And with that, uh, I think that I'd be happy for whatever time if we have a few questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? OK. I understand very well what is, what is the US market, but uh, you at the end of your talk, uh, you spoke of the world market. Yeah. Uh, world market is uh, something which I understand less. What do you mean with world? Okay. Uh, uh, basically, that, uh, that, that index there uh, is the data stream index uh, for, for the world equity markets portfolio. Uh, the two most widely benchmarks for the world market are the MSCI AC World and the FTSE. 
uh, of the world market, but if you compare the MSCI, the FTSE, the data stream, and the S&P, uh, the correlation among them is very high. So uh, those are typically markets that include, first, uh, developed and emerging markets, roughly nowadays in proportion 90 to 10. 90% 90 developed markets and 10% uh, emerging markets. T just uh, three years ago, emerging markets were 15% of that index, but now they're down to actually a little bit less than, than 10%. About 45% of that is a US market, so a good chunk of that uh, normal price is an expensive US market, which means that some other markets must be relatively cheap. Europe is one of them. If you look at Europe as a whole, it's relatively cheap in terms of both P ratios and, uh, and dividend yields. <coughs> and um, and then you have, you know, it's typically weighted by market cap. So you have the U.S. about 45%. Uh, you have uh, Japan about 9%. You have uh, England about 11%. Uh, you have... Uh uh, what about France, about 7 to 8 percent, and then it goes all the way down from there. Uh, Spain is uh, just about 1 percent of that work. So it's a world market cap, 90, nowadays 90 percent developed and 10 percent emerging markets. Now this uh, negative association that you showed us between the uh, dividend yield and uh, a long-term uh, subsequent returns with the dividend yield is positive with the PE yeah, sorry negative. yes so what what is your economic explanation for that is it, it do you uh, uh, consider that to be a consequence of time-bearing expected returns or is it some kind of e irrationality well, or oh, I, I, or? I think that in both because I mean the, the positive relationship between uh, the dividend yield and returns if you invert it is a negative relationship between price to dividends uh, and returns, and that is the same, uh, or almost the same, as the re negative relationship between price to earnings and, and returns. And that is simply the value effect. When you buy something that is actually expensive, your subsequent returns are poor. When you buy something that is cheap, your subsequent returns are high. So that negative relationship basically says that you enter the market with a cheap PE or PD, and your expected returns are high, and you enter the market with a high PE or PD, your expected returns. So that is, in a way, that is a picture that shows the value effect. That when you buy expensive, your returns are low. When you buy cheap, your returns are high. Now, for the US, you quoted 9.4 long-term return from 1900 to 2009. Yep. That was the nominal rate of return. It is nominal, yes. So we could alternatively look at the real rate of return. Minus 3%. Minus 3%. So my estimate of the real rate of return for the United States was 6.3, same time. Yeah. Now, for the future, you predicted 6.4 for the United States. Also nominal. Also nominal. But in the future, the inflation rate in the U.S. will be close to zero, maybe 1%. Historically, it was 3%. So basically, what your model says, in the future, in real terms, in the U.S., it will be exactly the same thing as the past. People get 6.4% in real terms in the long run. Right. Good. Um, Inflation is low now for historical standards in the U.S. and also in Europe. We know that they, you know, the, the ECB is actually trying to get it up, uh, but uh, the, the, I'm not sure, and I have no idea how to forecast inflation, but I, I'm not sure that inflation is going to remain as low as it is now. You have to remember that the U.S. economy is growing at a very slow rate, and I think you would expect, if history is any guide, that as the economy picks up, inflation will also pick up a little bit. Whether it's going to go back to the 3% historical, I don't know, but, but I agree with you that in, in terms of equity, uh, we don't see returns that are actually much lower or higher than what history <coughs> excuse me, has been in the, uh, in the past. The situation is a little bit different in the bond market, because in the bond market, you have 10-year yields at 2.5%. So if uh, inflation comes at the historical level, then you're losing money. In, you're not losing money. You're losing purchasing power by buying bonds. And, and it actually was a lot worse. Uh, if you go back to, say, July of the year 2012, uh, in the 10-year the yield was actually 1.5%. So it was basically crazy to buy 10-year bonds 
response at that point in time, unless the only thing that you wanted is to know exactly when you were going to get your, your cash flows. But I agree that uh, with inflation as it is now, we're more or less in real terms expecting the historical returns that we've gotten in the past. Uh, maybe I would say I would temper that a little bit by the fact that I don't think inflation is going to be as low as it is now. Final point. Now, I think your, in, your analysis was very good, but it should be done in real terms. And then we could also say more about uh, emerging countries, because in emerging countries, the inflation rate is typically higher. So we should predict their rate of return, not in nominal terms, but in real terms. Yeah. And then I, it would become... Uh, I, I agree with that. <laughs> Every time that I do something in real terms, people tell me, but in nominal terms, what would that be? So, you know, I, I always get it uh, wrong from that perspective. I, I think that it really depends on whom you talk to. I mean, if, if you talk to audiences of, of economists and investors, then they prefer real returns. If you talk to broader audiences, because the, the numbers that they see on the paper every day are nominal, then they relate much more to nominal numbers. But, but I agree. And there was... Uh, Gentlemen there. Two questions. Um, how much of the return the composition model stands if you try to apply it to sectors? And how much of a test has been made on individual securities? Because in principle you can use yeah, it. Yeah, uh, I, I, well, I, 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 I'm not going to call it testing. I, I played around with it. Uh, yeah, and, and it's bad. Uh, I mean, if you do it for individual securities, in some cases you just happen to get it right, and in some cases you're getting awful, which means that you, know, you might as well flip coins. Uh, so, so it's not really a model device for non-aggregate magnitudes, and that's what Bogle basically says. The more you aggregate the portfolio, the better it's going to be the, the, the forecast. <coughs> and I think that you know, by the same token, it's a little bit... Uh, uh, more accurate on sectors, and I think, if I remember correctly, because I played around with this uh, uh, thing some time ago, but it, it's more reliable for sectors that are relatively stable, like if you look at utilities and railways, uh, and it's awful for technology because it changes so much. Uh, but, but again, I think that it's a, it's a model that when I use it and when I discuss it, I usually do it in terms of aggregates, and in terms of aggregates, actually, I have a paper in which I evaluate the forecasting ability 10 years ahead of the model, and it's actually pretty good. Uh, and it's much better than making a forecast simply with the historical geometric mean return. So it outperforms that by quite a bit, but when you look at the aggregates. OK, uh, are there any more questions? Uh, if not, thank you. Again. Thank you very much.